Remember I said the first thing to do with functional groups is look for those six-membered rings, right? Look for the alternating single and double bonds because those you can name and kind of knock out first. Then look for the nitrogens because those are going to be amines or amides. Identify them second. Then find any sulfurs because you can name that. That gets rid of the third. Then the last thing to do is you're just looking at where the oxygens are because the oxygens, you see on your card, there's multiple oxygens. So there's multiple combinations. So those ones, like kind of like first knock out everything else and then look at those last because a lot of times I think it's easier to identify them because they're not the ones that haven't already been circled and just like figured out. So what do you see first? You see a what? Mm -hmm. A phenol. Mm -hmm. Yep. So phenol, right? So the first thing to do is look for the six-membered ring, okay? Look for the six-membered ring with the alternating single and double bonds. That's either a phenol or an aromatic. It's, a, it's an aromatic if there's no alcohol attached. It's a phenol if there is. So this is a phenol. So that's one. But now when you see the other ring, do you see that it doesn't have alternating single and double bonds? So that's not an aromatic or a phenol. It has to have that double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond arrangement. So there's no other ones. There's no other rings to identify. So now look for nitrogens. Do you see one? And it's in amine. Yeah, amine, amine. I don't care how you say it. Right? Okay. So see it here? And the reason it's not in amide is because I look at the carbon connected, any carbons connected to that nitrogen, there's no double bond oxygen. So if you look at your amide on your card, notice how the nitrogen, look at a car, the carbon it's attached to, has a double bond oxygen, that would make it an amide. So all you do is find a nitrogen and look at any carbons attached to it and do that comparison. If you don't see a double bond oxygen, it's an amine, okay? If there's just a single oxygen attached to that carbon, it doesn't matter, it's still an amine. The only time it would be an amide is if one of those carbons had a double bond oxygen, okay? So no more nitrogens, yeah. Okay, so find the six-membered rings, then find the nitrogens. Third one, are there any sulfurs? Okay, so a sulfur is automatically a thiol. You don't care what's attached. <laughs> you don't have to do any other, co you know, comparisons or anything like that. If there's a sulfur, then you know it's a thiol. All right, so that's taking care of all of those. So now look at the remaining oxygens. Okay, so how many oxygens do you see that have not already been circled? Two. So that means I got two more groups, potentially. Okay, so pick one and you... Tell me. The aldehyde. Very good. Yep. So do you see this? Do you see a carbon with a double bond oxygen and a hydrogen attached? That is an aldehyde. Aldehydes are always on the end. So see its shape. See how it's a carbon with a double bond oxygen and a hydrogen on the end of a chain. That is an aldehyde. One more. It's an alcohol. Mm-hmm. See the alcohol? So find the last oxygen. Do you see A? It's just OH. When you look at the carbon that it's attached to, see that it just has a hydrogen? Okay? So if that carbon doesn't have anything else, then it's just going to be an alcohol. Now, if that had a double bond oxygen, you could have a carboxylic acid, right? So there's other things it could be, but because it's just attached to a carbon, that makes this an alcohol. All right? So here's like the challenge of the day. <laughs> Do you see a chiral carbon, even one? So which, which carbons do you know cannot be chiral? Okay, any in the ring, any in the phenol can't be, why? Because they all have a double bond, right? So notice every carbon has a double bond in that ring. So none are chiral in here because we've got a double bond, okay? What about this CH2? Anything with the CH2 or a CH3 you know can't be. So I know this one can't be. I know this one can't be. I know this one can't be. Do you see any others that it can't be? Carbons where? There's one more that it can't be. That double bond oxygen. So see this one, right? So remember, you can automatically throw out any that have 
two hydrogens or three hydrogens, you can throw it. Any that you see have a double bond attached to it. So that helps to kind of like narrow things down a lot, okay? And I told you that I wouldn't bother with the ring structures. There actually are two, three carbocarbons in that ring structure, but we won't worry about those. But the ones that's not in a ring, what's the only carbon that's left that's not part of a ring? Uh-huh. See the one that's just below the thiol. So when you look at this one, do you see that it has one carbon? It has a thiol group. It has an aldehyde group. And then it has that entire ring, double ring thing to the one other side. Do you see that all of those are different? So this is a chiral carbon. Okay? Because it has one hydrogen, a thiol. Because remember, it's always like everything this way this way, all of this, and then that hydrogen. So all of those are different groups. But remember, when you're doing chiral carbons, it's the easiest thing to do, I think, is like just knock out all the ones you know it can't be. And then compare the ones that just have a single hydrogen, and then look above, below, left, and right. Okay? So that one's a little trickier. I told you that when I give you the questions about chiral carbons, that I would only ask you like ones, I'll give you like the whole Lewis structure. So they'll sort of be like already up, down, left, and right. A little easier, straight, more straightforward than this. But I did happen to see the chiral carbon. I was like, hmm, that one's interesting. All right. Second thing. Um, how many of you have applied for a scholarship? So the Nash Community College actually has its own foundation that raises money for scholarships. They actually do like a golf tournament every year. They do a... Um, a silent auction for art and all kinds of like stuff they collect. They also do a clay tournament, like where you shoot clays. So that's another one. But those are all done solely to raise money for scholarships for the NAS Community College Foundation. So last year they gave out, I think, $27,000 in scholarships. Okay. And they didn't have enough applicants to give money to. Do you know that? <laughs> So how many people have applied for the Nash Community College Scholarship? If you have not, it is like a single page thing. It is really easy. In fact, some of the scholarships require that you write like kind of a statement. Okay, what do you want to do with your life? Okay, so there is even a scholarship writing workshop that is being offered on the 16th and the 28th. So I think that's next Thursday. Somebody look at there. Yes. The 16th and the 28th, well, the 16th is actually Thursday. The 28th is a Tuesday from 3 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. English instructors are willing to, one, help you start a statement of what you want to do, what you want to be in your life kind of thing. They will help you even start if you have no idea how to even start it. If you have, like, a rough draft, they will review it and start to add, like, the fluffy, fabulous words to it, like, like, not how I write. Like, I'm like, A, B, C, done. Okay? But they like to pull out the thesaurus and do the big fluffy words. So I'm just going to really encourage you, if you have more than, if you have, like, you're planning on doing, being in school here for fall of 2023 through 24, there are oftentimes there's money without applications to give it to. Okay? Some of it is need-based, so some of it will require you to do the FAFSA forms and stuff. But some of it is actually based on your GPA. Some of it is based on your major. So there are actually specific funds given to certain majors. So there's like nursing scholarships. There's vet tech scholarships. Okay? Specifically like earmarks just for students in those programs. So if you don't fill out an application, you aren't even looked at. So they don't, they're not going to come and like track you down and be like, Diane, you need to put in an application. But I'm telling you, this application could literally take you five to ten minutes to do. Because some of the, the general application doesn't require that you have, like, the, the, the life goal statements. But there's actually even workshops to help make sure that your statement is putting in enough information about you to increase the odds of getting a good scholarship. Like getting a scholarship that, you know, maybe that will pay for your entire tuition and books for the semester. So if, you know, sometimes everything gets really tight, I know that that's like become kind of the norm. I'm really encouraging you. All you have to do is, and I can put a link to the scholarship in, on my Moodle page as well. So I can put it in the Chem 130 class. I'll put it in sort of like the, the resources link. 
and that way you click there it takes you directly to it like I actually did a letter of recommendation for somebody um, this week and it was like super easy like literally like one click took me right exactly to where I needed to go I didn't have to like search around for it so it wasn't too bad okay so that's big thing okay Make sure that you fill out a scholarship application if you are going to be here in the fall and spring of next year. Completely worth it. Whether you get Pell Grant, don't get Pell Grant. Some of it, like I said, is based on what your major is. Some of it is based on GPA. Some of it is based on need. So there's sort of like all of those criteria. So really don't like overlook that. If you're like, so I don't know, like with the, with the, high school students. I'm not sure how that works, but I would talk to your advisors to find out. Okay. All right. The other thing is, is I am going to push exam three back a week. So today we will get through the bulk of chapter five. We will finish five, start six next week. We should be able to finish six next Tuesday. Okay. So that means Thursday we'll actually be starting new material, but remember your fourth exam is a take-home exam. So that fourth exam your notes are what you're really going to be able, you're going to use and really need in order to complete that take home exam material. So just make a note of that. So normal, it was scheduled for the 14th a week from today. I'm going to push it back one more week just so that you know. All right. So last time we were talking about like, okay, why do reactions occur and how does like the energy exchange come into play? This middle section of the chapter talks about types of chemical reactions. So we have first these four basic types that occur. The first two are when you either build molecules or you break molecules down. So in what they call a synthesis reaction. So synthesis reactions, I always think of building reactions. So you take lots of little pieces and you're putting them together into a larger structure. So we're building. Most of the time, synthesis reactions require energy, right? Because you're taking two things and you've got to make a bond to link them together. So in doing that, you're having this energy requiring steps. The kicker in recognizing this, more reactants than products. So all you have to do is look at a chemical reaction. If you see more reactants than products, so it's like two things make one, four things make two, six things make 10, or sorry, six things make four, right? So as long as we have more reactants, fewer products, then that's going to be a synthesis reaction. Fewer products, more reactants. Decomposition reactions, you see they're exactly the opposite. And when I think of things decomposing, you think of things doing what? Breaking down, right? So disintegrating, falling apart. So think of decomposition as this breakdown. Oftentimes these give off energy because when you have something that has a bond and you break it, the energy that's held in that bond is released. Way to recognize this, more products. Fewer reactants, more products. And so again, it doesn't matter if I have one reactant and two products or if I have one reactant and 10 products or even two reactants and 10 products. As long as there's more products than reactants, it's considered decomposition. So it's literally like you just look for the arrow Count how many on this side, count how many on this side. More reactants, fewer products, synthesis. Look at the arrow, count reactants, count products. More products than reactants, decomposition. Okay. The third one is when you have the same amount. So notice in this, two reactants, two products. So I don't have a change. I didn't build something or break something, I'm really just swapping in this. So displacement or exchange reactions, you just kind of think, okay, well, there's this swapping. This swapping that's occurring, 
The reason this happens is the products are more stable than the reactants. So I'm not like building something up and having to use energy. I'm not breaking something down and releasing energy. Here, I'm just swapping chemical partners so that I can make something that's a little more stable. So if you see a compound, which would be this, right? So a compound would be two elements together. So compound like AB plus an element like C. If you see a compound and an element making a different combination of compound and element on the product side, that is called a single displacement. So when you look at this, can you see where it looks like C comes in and bumps A off? Okay, C comes and displaces or swaps places with A. A ends up now all by itself, and now C is combined with B. So I have this single swapping, and the kicker, the way to really recognize these, is look for a compound and an element. If you see two and two on both sides of the arrow, two reactants, two products, one isn't compound, one's an element, then you know it's a single displacement. The last one. So the last one is called double displacement because do you see in this, you start off with two pairs and then they end up completely swapping. So I'm doubly swapping. So in here, A is leaving B and joining with D. C leaves D, joins with B. So I have sort of like this chemical swapping of partners. The way you can identify this though is you see they're both compounds. Two compounds makes two different compounds. That's a double displacement. So the easiest thing to do is remember that the arrow is the divider. Look at what's how many on the left, how many on the right. If I have more reactants, fewer products, synthesis. If I have more products, fewer reactants, decomposition. But if they're the same, an element and a compound would be a single displacement. If they're the same and they're both compounds, then it's a double displacement. So now in this, well, let's look at these. So these are all your balancing equation questions. So in the first one, what would this be? Synthesis, right? So remember that your arrow is kind of the divider. Do you see that I have two reactants, one product? So this is synthesis. What about the next one? Double displacement. Mm -hmm. So do you see that you have two reactants, two products, and they're both compounds? See how B joins with the sulfate? Barium, BA, joins with the sulfate. Chlorine joins with the sodium. So I end up with sodium chloride and barium sulfate. Double displacement. So they're swapping their partners. Next one, decomposition. So everybody see that? Okay. If you're not sure about how any of these are, raise your hand. Decomposition because aluminum carbonate breaking down into aluminum oxide and carbon dioxide. Okay. Do the rest of these. Look at the examples. Synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement. See if you can figure out which ones these are. Okay, so what's this one? Iron oxide plus hydrogen makes iron and water. Single. Mm -hmm. Anybody not get that? All right, next one. Synthesis. So these are really easy. Like, honestly, all you've got to be able to do is, like, look where the arrow is and look at how many on each side. Okay. Next one. Single displacement. Next one. Synthesis. Next one, double, and the last one, synthesis. 
Okay, so you have a dynamic study module on chemical reactions that's due Sunday. So these, some of that is actually just identification of these four basic types. But now, I'll leave this one. You can do this. We'll practice it next time. Just a note, one, the way that we always draw reactions make it look like it goes from reactants to products. But there are conditions where you can take a product and actually reform the reactant. So good example, soda, okay? So if you buy a soda, so you've got a Dr. Pepper, okay? So the way that they make soda is they mix sugar, they mix water, they mix color, they mix flavorings. They pump it into a bottle or a can, and then they pump carbon dioxide in and seal it. So they add carbon dioxide. Now, before you opened your bottle of, of Dr. Pepper, did you see the bubbles of carbon dioxide before you opened it? Like when it sits on the shelf, like think like a two liter bottle. If you look at the two liter bottle, can you see bubbles? No, right? When it's sitting there. Now, if you squeeze that bottle, it's super hard, right? It's really solid feeling, but you can't actually see bubbles. I mean, you can shake it, but you can shake a bottle of orange juice and it's not carbonated. Right? So you could shake it and see some bubbles, but that's because you shook it. But if you just look at it, you don't see random bubbles inside of the soda. That is because carbon dioxide, which you know is a gas, it actually reacts with water. It reacts with the water that's in the soda, part of the sugar, flavoring, coloring, and water, and it forms this molecule, H2CO3, which is aqueous. H2CO3 is carbonic acid, and it stays dissolved. That's why when you look at a bottle of soda that's not open, you can't see any bubbles because it is reacted. The carbon dioxide reacts with the water, forms carbonic acid, and it's now dissolved until you do what? Open it, right? As soon as you open it, could you see bubbles along the outside, like along the, like along the inside walls? Yeah. So as soon as you open it, you start to see all these little bubbles forming. As soon as you open it, this carbonic acid will break down into carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and water. So do you see that this reaction is not like one direction? I can make carbonate a carbonated soda just by pumping carbon dioxide gas into the soda and sealing it and it will exist that carbon dioxide stays dissolved until I release the pressure and as soon as I release the pressure that carbon carbonic acid that H2CO3 will automatically break back down and start to form CO2 so you will see this drawn like this CO2 and that's as a gas plus H2O which is a liquid and the arrows look like this H2CO3AQ. So that's telling you aqueous just means it's dissolved in water. So that arrow, when you see an arrow like that, and I don't actually have the font to be able to do that arrow. I have to actually go online and like snip, snip that, that, that picture and like paste it when I put it in. So I have this. So you will sometimes see this. So just know if you see a line with arrows looking like they're going both directions, or if you see a half arrow this way, half arrow this way, same thing, okay? Both of those symbols, I mean the same exact thing. It's just that Microsoft Word does not do the half arrows in both directions. <laughs> it just doesn't, okay? So those both represent exactly the same. So they say then this reaction is reversible. Now, when you burn the charcoal briquette, is that a reversible reaction? No, right? Because you light the charcoal, and by the time it's all done, it's nothing but ash. You can't convert it back to the charcoal. So some reactions are not reversible. But if you see it, this double arrow, then just remember that means under certain conditions, I can have a forward reaction and a reverse reaction. So the next one, when you look at this reaction, does, can you tell, if is it a synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, or double displacement? Or does it not really fit any of those criteria? 
Could it be synthesis or decomposition? No. Why? Why can neither of those be synthesis or decomposition? They both have the same number of reactants and products, right? Synthesis will always have more reactants. Decomposition always has more products. So you can throw those out. But when you look at these, then you're like, oh, it's got to be an exchange. It's either single displacement or double displacement, but it doesn't fit that either, right? I have an element in a compound on the reactant side and two compounds on the product side. So it doesn't really fit either of the exchange reactions. In fact, this is a reaction all unto itself. So this is really almost like a fifth kind of reaction. Synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement. Now we have combustion, okay? So you've experienced combustion if you've ever seen a candle lit, if you've ever lit the charcoal, if you've ever lit a fire, had fire burning on the stove, fire in a fireplace. So everybody's been around combustion in some form or another. Combustion by definition is some type of carbon molecule, and we will just call it fuel. Right? Because remember, we talked about that in the last chapter. We said the hydrocarbons are good fuels. They release a lot of heat energy. Things like methane, butane, propane, octane. So all of those just carbon and hydrogen molecules. They make great fuels because they react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. So anytime you see a carbon molecule plus oxygen making CO2 and water, you know it's combustion. It could be a fuel plus oxygen makes water and CO2. That's the same thing. I just switched the position of the products so that still carbon dioxide and water would be on the product side in one way or another. That's a combustion reaction. So any kind of burning reaction, Remember that this releases a lot of heat energy. It's very exothermic reaction. Burning wood, burning natural gas, burning on your gas grill, having a burning wood, all those are examples of combustion. And they are irreversible. You can't switch them back. So unlike the reversible reactions, this arrow only ever goes one direction. But if... You do not have, all right, if you do not have enough oxygen, you can have what is known as incomplete combustion. So incomplete combustion, it still results in burning, but the burning is not generating as much heat and you don't end up with carbon dioxide and water. So this is always because there's not enough oxygen. So if you flick a Bic lighter, you know how it always has a yellow flame. If you light a candle, it always has a yellow flame. If you've ever lit a, like, if you've, like, burned wood, like, out in a fire pit or even in the, in the fireplace, you always have, like, this yellow flame. That's sort of like the ambiance, so people really like that. Look, it's so pretty. Okay? In fact... That is a sign of incomplete combustion because when there's not enough oxygen, the, the fuel, and we'll just use methane, which is natural gas, we'll just use that as our example. You could have wood, cellulose, you could have butane, you could have propane, any kind of fuel. But if there's not enough oxygen, then the carbon of the fuel does not completely combine with oxygen and make CO2. Instead, it makes two possible products. So the first one is it can make just this. So it can make just carbon. So it means like we split the fuel. So there's hydrogen gets ripped off of the carbon. The hydrogen will make water vapor, but the carbon just is left behind. There's not enough oxygen to actually combine. And this, when carbon is heated, it glows yellow. So when you see that yellow lappy kind of flame of a big lighter or of your fireplace or from a candle, it's actually an incomplete flame. It's an incomplete combustion and it ends up creating carbon. So the problem with this, one, if you take a candle and you put it too close to the wall 
and you let it burn, over time, you'll actually end up with this black kind of residue on the wall. So if you have a, some candles are worse about this than others, especially the ones that burn real fast, you'll end up with literally soot. So soot will start to build up. It's not going to catch the wall on fire. It's not that, but it's just releasing a little bit of carbon and carbon is black. So you'll end up with this little bit of soot. If and when people used to burn coal, so that was a long time ago, but coal used to be a major heating source for people. People would burn coal in their fireplace. People would burn wood in their fireplace. So you would have some incomplete combustion. So that meant that carbon would go up into the chimney and start to coat the walls of the chimney. That's why if you look at like, if you, if you do have a fireplace or if you look at any fireplace and you see it's black inside, that's just carbon. So that's carbon from that burning because if it burns too fast, it doesn't have the ability to combine with oxygen enough and you get some carbon formed. If you don't clean your chimneys, so if you have, if you, if you burn wood and you don't clean your chimney on an annual basis, this carbon begins to build up, build up, build up. And after a while, it's literally as if you have charcoal briquettes lining your chimney because that's what a charcoal briquette is, is it's mostly carbon that you then light and that then burns to carbon dioxide so what can end up resulting is what you see in that top right picture. So you can end up with a chimney fire because you have so much carbon soot that builds up in the walls of your chimney that that can ignite and that gets those bricks super hot. That can then ignite like the roof timbers. This used to happen on the regular. Doesn't as much because not many people like burn wood as their primary heating source because if you do, Every year, you have somebody come out and clean your chimneys. So they used to have professional chimney sweeps, right? So people that were, that's their job, full-time job. They would just go around and clean people's chimneys, especially when you're talking about cities. So think of like England and France, like back before they had any natural gas production and normal like electricity even. All the heating was done this way. She had people that had it look like a brittle brush like a bottle brush, and they, but it was huge. It was about this big, and they'd go climb up on top of the roof and, like, take this thing and, like, scrub and knock all the, ch all the carbon off of the walls of their chimney to cut down on the risk of having a chimney fire. Yeah, so, like, when people really, so, in the 1800s, like, that was a primary issue. So you, like, had people that was, like, a full-time job, and so they were, like, always covered in soot. <laughs> yes, you think of Mary Poppins, yeah. So you think like back when, <laughs> that was a job. So carbon is an issue because it becomes a potential fuel source later on. The other one though is the one that's a really big issue. And this, you know from naming, is called CO, it's not cobalt, CO is carbon monoxide. Capital C, capital O is carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is when the carbon it combines with only one oxygen instead of two. If it only combines with one, carbon monoxide is formed. Usually, this is formed in really low levels. <coughs> so it's not usually produced in high concentrations, but it's, it's produced in a low amount, kind of like the carbon is. You don't just make tons of carbon, you make a little bit, and that soot builds up slowly. Same thing here. If you burn wood or you burn fuel and it doesn't burn, if it burns incompletely, Carbon monoxide, it is an odorless, colorless gas. So you will not even recognize that it's actually there. The negative part to it is carbon monoxide actually binds to your red blood cells better than oxygen does. So normally, take a breath in, oxygen diffuses into your blood, and then it's transported to your cells so your cells can use it to make energy. If carbon monoxide binds, your cells can't use it, but it actually binds and takes the place of where oxygen should bind, and it doesn't get dropped back off, so it stays. So, like I said, it's typically produced in low levels. So you inhale it, that binds, you don't exhale it. You inhale some more, it binds, you don't exhale it. And it typically, because it's in low levels, it doesn't happen instantly. This happens over hours. So you find oxygen levels begin to go down. Now, if this happened instantly, you would feel like you were choking. You'd be like, oh, I can't breathe. And you'd like leave the area. But this happens really slow. So as oxygen levels go down, then 
your alertness decreases, then you fall asleep, but you actually lose consciousness because of that lack of oxygen. You get tired, weak, dizzy, lose consciousness. If you don't remove yourself from the source of the carbon monoxide, then eventually you will suffocate to death. Mm -hmm. So again, so carbon monoxide every year, and people are like, I never heard about this. Well, here. <laughs> Two women in apparent carbon monoxide leak die, okay? And that was in Chicago. Middle one, family had a car that had an exhaust leak, okay? Which meant, so they weren't like in the garage trying to kill themselves or anything like that. They were actually just sitting, the car was idling, but there was an exhaust leak. So that meant that their exhaust was leaking and it was like coming up through the floorboards. So the family, like, they all got sick, sick enough that they actually had to stop, get out of the car, and they recognized what the issue was. Last one, and this is one that you always see after hurricanes, okay? After natural disasters, especially in the United States, entire family dies of carbon monoxide poisoning after Hurricane Ida. In fact, with Hurricane Ida, more people died of carbon monoxide poisoning than died from the hurricane. Why? So what happens after a hurricane? What do you lose? You lose power. And so people have generators. They have gas power generators. So a gas power generator, you just pour gas in, you start it, like it's not always a pull start anymore. A lot of them are now electric ignition ones and everything. But it's like, it generates energy by burning that gasoline. So then you can plug into that generator run an extension cord and plug in your refrigerator, plug in your freezer, plug in your microwave, plug in your electric stove, so you can still run your appliances, okay? So that way, like, all of your freezer stuff doesn't melt. So that is why people typically have a generator and sort of, like, stash for in case they need it. Problem comes into play is where do you usually put your generator? In the garage, okay? And if it's in the garage and it's raining, what are you going to do? Close the garage door. Okay, so the garage door is closed and you have this combustion that's occurring inside of a closed room. Incomplete combustion is typical for any kind of generator. It just doesn't burn completely efficiently, but people have to leave the door cracked to run the extension cord. So now the door is open just a little bit, just enough so the extension cords can be run into the house People are in the house, what's being produced in the garage now? Carbon monoxide. And so carbon monoxide's a gas. It doesn't just stay in the garage. It begins to diffuse from the garage through the partially open door into the house. You don't notice it because you're not like choking. It doesn't happen instantly. It happens over hours and hours. And oftentimes, this is like what you do at night, right? To run like the lights and things like that so you can see, get ready for bed. And so you leave it on to keep your appliances running throughout the evening. Everybody goes to bed, entire family found dead. So carbon monoxide levels built up over the evening while everybody was asleep. No one even noticed it. And so then it's like that's not a good thing to have to come and find people like that. But it happens every single time there's a natural disaster. Every single time there's this loss of power, you start to have these reports of carbon monoxide poisoning that occurred. Like family members, when like no one, no one comes to see them, no one's like hanging out, no neighbors, you know, neighbors are like, well, go check on so-and-so. This happens also, sometimes people have kerosene heaters. So kerosene heaters need to be vented but sometimes people don't have them vented correctly, so that means that exhaust fumes come from the kerosene heater and end up collecting in the room, can also create carbon monoxide levels. And so these are things like in the wintertime you find this, anytime there's this loss of power in an area, you end up finding this. So it is a major issue. So this one, these are actually from 2021. So I haven't found them, but I can guarantee if you actually Google carbon monoxide poisoning, you can find reports of this happening, especially where they're having big snows out west, because big snows means power outages. Power outages means people are going to be firing up their generators, and if they're not vented correctly, if you don't make sure that you're like sealing off any potential entry of carbon monoxide, that there's going to end up being fatalities because of it.
So that's what happens with incomplete combustion. You worry about fire hazards, and you also worry about carbon monoxide. Like those are two big safety things. In fact, you can't install a gas pack heater anymore without installing a carbon monoxide detector. So that is law. So in North Carolina, if you even if you have a any replacement of a unit, if there's any gas that's used in the house, by law, you have to have a carbon monoxide detector. It's kind of nice because they run their smoke detectors too. Like they do dual jobs. All right. So then this brings us to sort of like a six category. And so this one is actually when you have swapping of specific things in a reaction. So they call it oxidation and reduction. Oxidation and reduction is what can happen in a reaction if you have a, an exchange of electrons, an exchange of oxygen, or an exchange of hydrogen. So those are really the three things that you will see with oxidation and reduction. You will see swapping of electrons, oxygen, or hydrogen. So what kind of bond do you remember is where there's a transfer of electrons? What kind of bond is that? Where you have a transfer of electrons that occurs. Ionic, right? So ionic is something like sodium plus chlorine making sodium chloride. So that is actually an example of oxidation and reduction. So sodium so the metal sodium, oh, that doesn't look good on there. Let's see if I can change color so it shows up better. So sodium, Na, that looks a little better. So we know sodium, if you look, it's on, in group one. So sodium has that one electron. If it can get rid of it, then it's going to be more stable. So sodium is a metal, and this is characteristic of all metals. Metals, when they form an ionic compound, remember, they always lose an electron. They always become positively charged. They form that positive ion. So sodium, as a product, now has a plus charge. Chlorine is a great example of what happens in this reaction. So chlorine has seven valence electrons. If it gets eight, remember that makes it like a noble gas. So the chlorine is going to gain because it's a nonmetal. It is going to gain an electron and ends up being a negative ion. So really the chlorine's over there. So because sodium loses that electron, it is said to be oxidized. So a rule you can have is that metals are oxidized. Nonmetals are always reduced. So the one that is gaining the electron is reduced the one that is losing its electrons or oxidized. So you can say that it's going undergoing oxidation, because that's kind of a noun, or you can say that it's oxidized. Sounds more like a verb. Either one's fine. So oxidation or oxidized, either one's fine. Reduction or reduced, either one's fine. They're really referring to the exact same thing. So you can remember as a rule of thumb, Metals lose electrons. And that's oxidation. So in an ionic compound, a metal will lose its electrons, and that's oxidation. So they use like a shortened term, like a mnemonic for this. So they say LEO. So if you can remember LEO, Leo is loss of electrons is oxidation. L-E-O. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Nonmetals metals 
is always going to gain electrons, and that is reduction. So when I was learning this for the first time, the mnemonic that we remembered, this was GER. So LEO, loss of electrons, is oxidation. GER, gain of electrons, is reduction. So I remembered it as Leo, the lion goes GER. So this is when you form an ionic compound. So ionic compound is an example of how oxidation and reduction occurs. I got a couple of others, though. So we just did this. We just did this. But oxidation can also be this swapping of oxygen or swapping of hydrogen in a reaction. So if you have two reactants and one gains oxygen, that gets oxidized. So if you have this gain of oxygen, that is oxidation. We just talked about combustion, right? So we put CH4, and we'll just use complete combustion as the example. So in this, CH4 plus O2 makes CO2 in water. So we said that's a combustion reaction. But in this, do you see that the carbon and the hydrogen both end up combining with oxygen. So the, when I look at CH4, and the way that I like identify oxidation and reduction is look at the reactant and what happens. So the carbon becomes combined with carbon dioxide, or sorry, as with oxygen, and so does the hydrogen. So both of those end up being broken apart, the carbon and the hydrogen, and both of them end up merging with oxygen. So they gain oxygen, which means that they are oxidized. So fuels are always oxidized in a reaction. The oxygen, if oxygen is an, a reactant, it is always reduced because it's always providing oxygen. If oxidation happens, reduction happens as well. But you can put a note that oxygen as a reactant is always reduced. It's always oxidizing other things. So if it's the source of the oxygen, that's oxidation. Then the last one. So the last example is change in hydrogen. Okay, so if you gain or lose, so if one molecule has hydrogen, the other molecule does not, and then, or the reactant side, on the product side, there is this swapping of hydrogen that occurs. That is oxidation and reduction as well. So these are kind of like the four examples. And so you'll see one of these, or nothing more complicated than these on an exam. In these four examples, we've talked about these two. Anytime you see a metal plus a nonmetal forming an ionic compound. So remember, one way to, figure, to pick this out is it's going to be a synthesis. It's going to be a synthesis. It's going to be a metal and a nonmetal. So if you see a synthesis reaction and I ask you what's oxidized and what's reduced, the metal is always oxidized because it loses its electrons. The nonmetal is reduced. And notice you always identify the reactant. You don't identify the product as being oxidized or reduced. If you see a combustion reaction, so any kind of fuel, any kind of fuel molecule, so it could be CH4, it could be C3H8, it could be C6H12, so any of them, any fuel plus oxygen making carbon dioxide and water, the fuel is always oxidized and the oxygen is always reduced. Now, after seeing this, a lot of students go, well, so what you're saying really is the first thing's always oxidized and the second thing's always reduced. No. <laughs> okay? So you can't just randomly go, well, that's the way it's always written. It does seem like it looks like that a lot, but it's just as easy to switch them. So in this one, so in this, if, and I just used X and Y as like generic things. So you tell me what happens to X. Find X on the reactant side and then X over on the product side. So what happens to it? It does what? 
Okay, does it gain or does it lose? Does it gain oxygen? It loses oxygen. See how it's XO and now it's just X. So can you see that this loses oxygen? So this reactant, whatever it is, it's got oxygen to begin with, but on the product side, it doesn't. So if it loses oxygen, what is that? It's reduced. Okay, now look at Y. Sorry, I got really loud. I gotta shut the door. <laughs> I didn't mean to like shut you up. <laughs> okay, so now look at this one. So now look at Y. What happens to Y? Do you see the change? So you see Y starts off by itself, but then on the product side it has gained an oxygen. Right, so it's gained oxygen. That means it is oxidized. So if you see a synthesis reaction, metal is oxidized, non-metal is reduced. If you see a combustion reaction, fuel is oxidized, oxygen is reduced. If you see a single displacement, you want to look and see, okay, what got swapped? Did oxygen get swapped or did hydrogen get swapped? Because those are one of the two, okay? So in this one, I see there's swapping of oxygen that happens. And notice that I identify the reactant as oxidized or reduced, not the product. I have to look at the product because I have to figure out what happens but it's always the reactant side that you identify as oxidized or reduced. So now the last one. So this one, the rule here, so we said loss of electrons, gain of hydrogen, or sorry, gain of oxygen, mean hydrogen. In the last one with hydrogen, it's loss of hydrogen. All of these are what? These oxidation or reduction. These are all oxidation. That means reduction is the exact opposite. So oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is going to be gain. Mm -hmm. So gain of electrons. Oxidation is gain of oxygen. Reduction would be loss. And so in the last one, if you lose, and you, I like remember loss of electrons, loss of hydrogen. Electrons and hydrogen do the same thing. Loss of electrons, loss of hydrogen, those are both oxidation. So reduction, gain of electrons or gain of hydrogen. These are reduction. So you tell me what happens in this last one. So again, I just have generic X and Y, okay? They're not elements, there is no elements X and Y. So those are just saying, I have these two reactants, X and Y. So X starts off with H, and then what happens in this reaction? Mm -hmm. So now it loses the hydrogen. So that means it is oxidized, right? Loss of hydrogen is oxidation, but then what happens to H, or to Y, sorry? Mm -hmm. So you see that Y ends up gaining the H? So the H gets swapped from the one to the other. The one that loses the H gets oxidized, just like loss of electrons, but this is losing hydrogen. The one that gains the hydrogen, that is reduction, or you would say it's reduced. So if you said it's reduced, or if you say it's reduction, it doesn't matter. It means the same thing. So HX loses hydrogen, it gets oxidized. Y gains that hydrogen, it gets reduced. So you got your little chart written right there. So that's really kind of like the way to pick them out. So now let's do some that are like real. So look at these four. In each case, identify the reactant as being oxidized or reduced. Okay. So, first one, what is this? Does this say change in electrons, hydrogen, or oxygen? So you could say it's a change in oxygen, okay? So you would say that V is? So uh, rule of thumb, if oxygen is a reactant, what is it always happens to it? It's always reduced. So you're just safe saying, okay, that one, if there is just, if oxygen's a reactant, it's reduced. The other thing's oxi oxidized, you can move on. <laughs> but in fact, if you look at this, you see it's a synthesis reaction. A plus B makes C. 
this is an ionic reaction. This is the formation of an ionic compound. So because this is a one, this is a synthesis reaction. And the only examples I gave you of oxidation reduction for synthesis reactions are always forming ionic compounds. So on your periodic table, where is V? So see that V is like the fifth column over? It's a metal. Okay? We don't even know the name of it, but you see that it's a metal. Oxygen over on the other side of the zigzag line, it's a nonmetal. So that means that V is what? It's oxidized, right? Because the metal always loses its electrons and it's oxidized. So what you're saying is the reactant is the you have to look at the other side, but you're not going to identify the other side because those are what's formed. It's really what's happening to the reactants is what you're thinking of, okay? What's happening to the stuff I start with? And you have to look at the product side to figure out what happens, but you identify what happens to the reactants. So then oxygen, if oxygen is ever a reactant, you can be comfortable saying it is always reduced. Because it's always going to give oxygen to other things. It's always going to gain electrons. All right, so then looking at this next one. What kind of reaction is this? Nope, it's a combustion. Mm -hmm. So remember, fuel plus oxygen making carbon dioxide and water. And so if I say water and carbon dioxide, that's the same thing. I've just switched to the two products. So in that case, the fuel is always what? This is going to be oxidized. And here's oxygen again. So we know that oxygen is reduced always. Going down the next one. So now this one, what's actually happening? So I have Fe3O4, iron oxide, plus hydrogen forms iron and H2O. It's a single displacement. So everybody see that? Compound plus an element making a different element in a compound. So I know this is a single displacement. So now I'm looking at is hydrogen swapped or is oxygen swapped? So what happens in this one? Which one's swapped? Oxygen. Can you see that? So see how Fe3O4 becomes the iron is now by itself? So what happens to the iron? You would say the iron is... Reduced. But if you look at hydrogen, and then you look at what happens on the product side, what happens to the hydrogen? It's oxidized. So it gains that oxygen that comes from the iron oxide. Okay, last one. Again, element compound makes element and compound. So this is a Single displacement, if it's a single displacement, look to see, is oxygen getting swapped or hydrogen getting swapped? So in that one, if you look at NH3, what happens to NH3? Mm -hmm. Do you see that that nitrogen goes from NH3 to just N2? So it is oxidized. Mm -hmm. Oxidized or oxidation, either one is fine. Do you see that it loses hydrogen? But the bromine, what happens to it? Gains those hydrogen, so that means it is reduced. Okay, so in those, identify if it's synthesis, then you know it's an ionic reaction. Metals are oxidized, nonmetals reduced. If you see that it's plus oxygen making CO2 in water, then it's a combustion reaction. Fuel is oxidized, oxygen is reduced. If it's a single displacement, then look at the reactants. Are they swapping oxygen or is it swapping hydrogen in the reaction? That's how you identify for the oxidation reduction. We don't like do oxidation numbers. This is as far as we go. Okay, so there is another one, another set here. Okay, so we'll do these ones next time. So if you get a chance, see if you can come up with these ones. These are good practice ones that you can do. One last example before we move away from oxidation and reduction. Oxidation and reduction, this is a common reaction that happens inside of cells as a way to just like rearrange things, as a way of taking oxygen from this molecule, moving it to this one, taking hydrogen from this molecule, moving it to this one. So it's a one that we're going, you'll see as we go along through, but 
One good example is actually how ethanol or alcohol is detoxified in your body. So if you have a glass of wine or if you have a beer or if you have a shot of whiskey, whatever, any kind of alcoholic drink, then you're ingesting ethanol. So ethanol is CH3, CH2OH. It's two carbons, got that alcohol group on it. So ethanol, once it's absorbed, it's absorbed or once it's ingested is really quickly absorbed in the lining of the stomach. It doesn't even have to do like the whole go all along down through the GI tract. It gets absorbed straight through the lining of the stomach. But now it's in the bloodstream. When it goes through the bloodstream, now it passes through the big filter in the body, which is your liver. And your liver's job is to filter out and remove things that are not nutrients. <laughs> so this includes like aspirin, Tylenol, medications, the prescription meds. It's your liver's job to break those things down. So when they say that you should take two Tylenols every four to six hours, that is because it takes your liver that long to break it down. Your liver's this big filter. So the job of the liver is to take ethanol and break it down. And it does this by removing hydrogen. So if you look at ethanol, see that there's two carbons. So it's really C2. There is six hydrogens and one oxygen. So if I just did its molecular formula, two carbons, six hydrogens, one oxygen, it converts using an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. It dehydrogens the alcohol is kind of what this enzyme does. And it converts it to what's called acetaldehyde, which do you see there's still two carbons? But now how many hydrogens? Just four. Mm -hmm. So if you count up the number, the CH3COH, there's only four hydrogens. It still has that oxygen. So those two hydrogens get pulled off. So if you lose hydrogen, what is that? Oxidation. So you would say this enzyme speeds up the oxidation of ethanol in your liver. Why? Ethanol is actually toxic. So ethanol as a molecule is toxic to cells. So your liver converts it to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde you can actually use for energy. So you can actually then shuttle this into normal metabolism. Like, oh, you're talking about like the ethanol and gas? Yes, so what they found with gasoline, so gasoline has to come from crude oil. So like you actually get oil out of the ground and then they distill it to purify it and you get the grades. What they have found is they can add ethanol, which can be cheaply made from corn. So a lot of the field corn that you see now, a lot of that corn actually is fermented to make ethanol and they can add it. It's an additive to gasoline. It's cheaper. They say your car doesn't get as good a gas mileage as it does on regular gasoline, but it's helped cut down the cost so that we're not importing as much oil. So by adding like 5 to 10%, that can end up decreasing the amount of oil like dependency. So that's, that's when they talk about ethanol that's in it. It is actual ethanol, but like, you wouldn't want to drink that because it's got all the gasoline stuff in there too. Like, so that would not be the plan. Okay. But when you have anything that's like considered an alcoholic drink, so that would be any kind of, any, any liquor or any beer or wine, that's going to have just ethanol as a certain percent, right? Like most beers are 5%, wine's about 13%, liquors like, can be like 40%, okay? But that's your liver's job. Ethanol's actually toxic. What's amazing is a normal healthy liver can actually detoxify ethanol at a rate of about a glass of wine an hour. So about one drink, right? So that would be like one like regular 12-ounce can of beer, like one six-ounce serving of wine. Not like I have a friend that has a mug that's almost like that size. I'm like, that's not a serving. <laughs> okay? If it fits in a glass, does that does not make it a serving? Okay? So, but your liver can manage that amount because those enzymes take the ethanol, oxidize it, convert it to acid aldehyde, take the ethanol, oxidize it, and it can do a certain speed, like the rate, how fast it can go. It's doing it as fast as it can, so a glass an hour, it can handle. The problem comes into play is when you're ingesting more than a glass an hour. Now your liver cells can't keep up. So that means now ethanol stays in the blood longer and longer. And in fact, the most sensitive are the cells that detoxify. Your liver cells 
are most sensitive to excess alcohol and some of those liver cells get overwhelmed and they die. When you have a healthy liver, you can be in a car wreck, tear your liver, they take that torn piece off, it'll grow back. It's pretty amazing. Your liver is regenerative as long as it's healthy. But if you damage the liver because of chronic exposure to toxins, that converts the liver into scar tissue. It doesn't happen overnight, unless you like to take a bottle of Tylenol. It doesn't happen overnight. When you're talking about alcohol abuse, this usually takes years, decades. So slowly over time, the liver becomes more and more scarred and begins to filter less and less. And I will tell you that is a terrible way to die. Liver failure is not a way to go. You end up being orange. You end up being out of your head because you can't, like, you have so much ammonia <coughs> in your blood. You end up looking like a big orange oompa loompa. Terrible. That's cirrhosis, okay? You can't survive without a liver, okay? So that's what ends up happening. So that's sort of like, keep that in mind. <laughs> One drink an hour, your liver's happy and fine, okay? Like throwing it way down, like I've, like, I've like seen some people that I was like, I don't even know. I don't even know how you're standing right now, okay? So that can just end up leading to cirrhosis. Unfortunately, if your alcohol is circumspect, it might actually contain wood alcohol. So ethanol is made from grain, made from corn, it's made from wheat, made from barley, whatever, or even from grapes. So it's made from some kind of sugar source. But methanol is actually made from wood pulp. Methanol is fermented by yeast as well. But if you ingest this, the same enzymes, remember I told you that enzymes are super specific? This is an enzyme that does the same to both of these molecules. See where it takes and it removes two hydrogens from the methanol, but what does it make? Anybody know what that is? Anybody remember? Where do you find this? This is a component in what? In your fetal pigs, right? Huh? This is in embalming fluid. Right? So if you took A and P and you had to dissect your pig and you're like, good God, this is terrible smelling. Okay? <laughs> That's because it has formalin. Formalin contains formaldehyde. Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and they use a lot less toxic stuff that, than what we used to use, but... I used to be able to smell it in my hair. <laughs> that was always horrible. I was like, yes, yeah. so if you were like hanging out and like like mounting tissue slides and stuff for an entire day, I could actually smell formaldehyde in my hair. I just drive home with the windows down. <laughs> but formaldehyde, this is why during prohibition, people used to make bathtub gin. Have you ever heard of that? People that were bootleggers used to make um, whiskey out in the woods. <laughs> they would like actually do their corn mash. They would like distill it by using like the cold creek water as part of their chiller. And so if you don't maintain the correct temperature when distilling, you won't distill just ethanol. You'll also distill methanol. Okay. So if you distill methanol in a high percentage, now these people are actually ingesting methanol, which their liver converts to embalming fluid. So that's never a good thing. <laughs> so that typically sensitive cells will end up being damaged, people go blind, people end up having massive liver failure because of the damage that it causes to the cells that make the formaldehyde, okay? So that's kind of the last example. So do make sure that you check that. So do make sure that you, you go through, practice these ones. So the ones we'll go through on Thursday is we have the common organic kind of reactions. We're gonna talk about condensation and hydrolysis, hydrogenation and hydration reactions. These are reactions that organic molecules use to join together, break apart, or do some rearranging of bonds, just common organic molecule structures. And then we'll actually talk about lipids as part of this chapter.